Welcome back, you exceptional Excel student. This is part two of our point of sale lesson. In the first lesson covered XLOOKUP. I'll assume you've already created your point of sale lesson workbook through the end of that lesson. If you haven't, please go back and start there because this lesson picks up where part one left off. And in this lesson, we're going to create drop down lists. We'll learn about data validation, input messages, error messages, worksheet protection, and more. So buckle up, it's time for big learning. Next, we're going to work with data validation. So we're first going to put a pale yellow background in the cells where the user should enter values. We'll merge the cells for the name and the address fields up top so that B and C become a single cell. We'll add a drop down list so that the user doesn't have to type in a part number. They can just select that from the list. And we'll learn how to protect the worksheet so that we only allow data entry into these yellow cells. First, let's select the cells for a yellow background. Now, those will be cells A5 through B9. Then we'll make a non-adjacent selection. So on the Mac, hold down the Command key. On Windows, hold down the Control key. And we'll select B1 through C2. Then on the Home ribbon, we can pull down next to the Paint bucket and select Pale Yellow. Now I want the values in B1 and B2 to be merged with C1 and C2. So I'll highlight from B1 to C2. And then on the Home ribbon, I'll pull down next to Merge and Center. I'll select Merge Across. And now if I enter a name in B1 and Tab, I move from B1 one to D1, there's no C1. Now let's click back on A5 to enter a part number. Now our X lookup works great as long as we have a valid part number, but the user can enter a wrong part number and come up with nothing. For example, if I enter a part number using the letter O instead of zeros, a common mistake, I get nothing. Well, we're gonna fix this by creating a drop down list containing all of the possible part numbers, and we'll make this list available whenever the user is clicked in a cell in the part number column. Here's how to do that. First, I'll undo the incorrect part number value that I entered, Command-Z on the Mac, Control-Z on Windows. Then I'll highlight the range of cells where I want to add my drop-down list. That's A5 through A9. And then to add the drop-down list, we use the data validation feature in Excel. Now we can find that under the data ribbon. It's toward the center of the ribbon, just to the right. Click data validation, and that brings up the data validation box. Now, even though we're going to be adding a list for data validation, know that you've got a bunch of options that you can use to make sure that the users entered valid values. Under Allow, you can select whole numbers. You can see this allows you to set a minimum and a maximum value, among other options. You can set validation for dates. You see the options aren't just limited to between two values. You see you could select not between, equal to, not equal to, greater than, less than, and many more. Feel free to explore these options on your own. But for now, we want to select the option that says List. Then we want to click in the Source field. And we could manually enter the values to form our list. But since we have the part numbers on our worksheet, I'm going to select the range of values that contain our part numbers, that's G3 through G10. Excel enters these as an absolute reference, that's fine. And we'll leave these other two values checked. Ignore blank allows us to have blank values in a cell, that's what we want. Otherwise, it forces the user to fill in the cells with a valid value before they can click off the cell and move to another cell. And that's usually not a very good user experience. And the in cell dropdown will add a dropdown list accessible via a little triangle that's going to show up in the lower right hand corner of each cell. Now, while we're here in data validation, we can also add an input message and an error message. So let's first click on the input message tab. Input messages show up when the user is clicked in a cell. It's optional, but an input message can be used to give the user some instructions for data entry. So why don't we add one? For title, I'll put in part number. And for my input message, I'll enter, please select a part number from the drop down list. And why don't we enter an error message too? So click on the error alert tab. I'll enter the title as error and the error message as not a valid part number. Now, there are other alert styles that we can work with, including warning and information alerts, but we'll stick with the stop alert. That'll present the user with two options either retry or cancel. So now that we've set up our data validation, let's click OK. And we see right away our input message shows up almost like a little post-it note underneath our cell. Now we can delete the value in here, and we're still allowed to move to another cell. But if we return and type the wrong value, like WJ001 using the letter O's instead of zeros, if I then try to tab to another cell, we see our error message shows up, not a valid part number. Cool. Now we could enter a valid part number and we get no error, but even more impressive is this little triangle in the lower right hand corner of the cell that when clicked will expose the drop down list and all of the values in the range that we added in our data validation box. That was G3 through G10. That includes all of our part numbers. Nice. Now you can click on any valid part number that will enter it. You can also go back and change that value. And if you want to use just the keyboard, you can open the drop down menu from the keyboard by typing option plus down arrow on the Mac or alt down arrow on Windows. Then use the arrow keys to make the selection you want and press return to accept it. Very nice. 
Now, if we're going to be distributing this worksheet to end users to use, we want to make sure that they can't change any of the cells that aren't in yellow. But right now, if a user moves to a cell like C5 and types any sort of nonsense, they can remove the formula that we had in this cell and our lovely point of sale system will no longer work. So let's fix that. Locking the cells in a worksheet is a two-step process. We unlock only those cells that we want to use for data entry, and then we protect the worksheet by clicking Protect Sheet on the Review ribbon. And here's an illustration to help you think about how this works. In here, I want you to think about your worksheet as a house. Think about each cell as a room in the house. Now, by default, all the cells in Excel are locked, but the worksheet starts off as unprotected. So you can still get in all the cells, and you can still enter data anywhere you want. It's like having a house with locks on all the windows, but the front door is still open, and you can get into all the rooms. Now, the reason why Excel locks all of the cells by default is that there are many more cells in the worksheet that you won't want to use for editing. So Excel assumes they're all going to be locked, and it's actually less work for you to highlight and unlock specific cells that you want to use for data entry, rather than to highlight and lock all of the other cells. So to keep with our house metaphor, unlocking a cell is like unlocking the windows in our spreadsheet house. Now we do this unlocking by highlighting the cells we want to be editable, opening the format cells box, clicking on the protect tab, and then clicking off the checkbox that says locked. Now at this point, our front door on our spreadsheet house is still open, nothing is protected, we can still edit all the cells. So to lock the front door or to protect the worksheet or workbook, we click the review tab, this is a ribbon we haven't used before, and then we click protect sheet, that's like locking the front door of our spreadsheet house. Now a quick warning here, you want to make sure that you click on protect sheet and not this icon next to it that says protect workbook. That does not protect all the sheets in the workbook at once, it does something different. So remember, if you want to lock cells, click protect sheet and not protect workbook. And at this point, the only way to get into a cell room is if that cell is unlocked. Sort of like the only way that you would get into a house that has the doors locked is if you had an open window. And you cannot edit any of the cells where you haven't specifically unlocked the cell by checking off the locked option in format cells. So let's try this out. Now again, by default, all the cells in the workbook are locked. So I'm gonna first select the cells that I want to unlock. I'm gonna select the range from A5 through B9. Then I'll do a non-adjacent selection, that's holding down the Command key on the Mac or the Control key on Windows. Then I'll select the range B1 and B2, and then I'll head over to the Home tab, select Format over here on the right, and Format Cells. And then I'll click on the Protection tab. And by the way, let me show you an alternate way to get here. So I'm going to cancel out of this box, and you can also get here by using the Context Sensitive menu. Just right-click on anywhere in your selection, then select Format Cells. And since the last tab we were in was the Protection tab, that's what shows up first. Now see, these cells that I've highlighted are locked by default, so the locked checkbox is checked. I'm going to click off the locked checkbox. This is like opening all the windows to access those cells. I'll click OK to close format cells. And now the front door of this worksheet is still open and everything can be edited, locked and unlocked cells alike. But just to show you that the other cells are locked, I'm going to select any random range that wasn't part of the cells that I just unlocked. And if I right click on the context sensitive menu, select format cells, head to the protection tab, I can see these cells are still locked and so are all the other cells that I didn't just unlock. So I'll cancel out of this, and now what I need to do is to protect the worksheet that locks the front door so that nothing can be edited unless I've specifically unlocked those cells. Now do that by clicking on the Review tab, and remember here you want to click on Protect Sheet and not Protect Workbook. If you're curious what Protect Workbook does, that prevents the user from adding, moving, deleting, hiding, or renaming worksheets. But if you want to lock the front door and our locked cells, you've got to click Protect Sheet. And now this box slides down and you can enter a password. Don't do that here, but feel free to try this on your own. Be aware that there's a risk associated with entering a password. If you forget your password, you're out of luck. There's no recovery option, so use this with caution. As a side note, I always recommend a password manager that works across all devices, like 1Password. If you don't have one, make it a priority to get one today, it saved my bacon on a number of occasions. <laughs> Now in this box, there are two checkboxes that are checked by default. We'll leave both of these checked. If we checked off locked cells, then you wouldn't be able to click on any cells that were locked. If we clicked off select unlocked cells, then the user wouldn't be able to click on different unlocked cells. They'd only be able to navigate by tabbing around the worksheet. So these settings are good. We'll click OK. And special bonus for Mac users, if you have a protected worksheet, you'll see a little padlock just to the left of the worksheet's name in the worksheet tabs down below. Now if I click in one of my cells that isn't highlighted in yellow, remember Remember, all of those cells are still locked. So if I try to type into one of those cells, I get an alert message that says that the cell is part of a protected worksheet. So I'll click OK here.
here, and now if I press tab, Excel automatically moves me to the next available unlocked cell. And if I keep tabbing, I move all around the worksheet through my unlocked cells. Those are all the ones that I've highlighted in yellow. And when I tab out of this last cell, I restart in the first unlocked cell on the worksheet, that's cell B1, and that's looking pretty slick. I can now give this worksheet to users, and I don't have to worry about them changing any data that shouldn't be changed or ruining any of my formulas. So feel free to tab around the worksheet and verify that things are working as expected. Notice I've accidentally typed a backslash into the quantity cell for B6. Now I could have prevented this by adding some additional data validation for whole numbers in this cell range. So feel free to explore that option on your own if you'd like. But after doing some additional experimentation to make sure that your newly protected worksheet is working fine, we're going to go ahead and make some additional changes. And in order to do that, we need to unprotect the worksheet. So let's head back to the review tab. We'll click on unprotect sheet. This acts as a toggle. So I've just toggled off the protection. The icon changed from saying unprotect sheet. It now says protect sheet. And now I can keep editing all the cells in my worksheet. So now I'm going to show you an issue that shows up with our current worksheet design. So let's imagine I want to add a product to our product list. I want to add an Excel sticker to the products that we sell. So I'll click in cell G11. I'll give the sticker a new part number, S002. I'll tab to the next cell, enter the description as Excel sticker. I'll tab to the next cell, enter the price as $3. And now if we head over to any of the cells in the part number area in column A and click on the drop down menu, I don't see my new part number in this list. No S002. Well, Excel doesn't add new lines to our drop down list automatically, but we can fix this. And we can do this by turning the products list into a table. First, let's delete this Excel sticker from our products list. I'll highlight the three cells for that sticker from G11 through I11. Head over to the Home tab, click to the right of the eraser icon, and select Clear Contents. Then we'll highlight everything we want to put inside of the products table. So we'll highlight from G2 through I10. Then I'll use the table creation shortcut on the Mac. That's Command T. On Windows, it's Control T. We'll keep the selection for headers. We've got headers in here, so we'll click OK. And we've got a table. And just to be fancy, I'm going to go and scroll to the left in the table styles, and I'll change it to this one here that has black headers and borders around the rows. And now, watch what happens if I start to enter a new product just below the last row in the products table. Excel will automatically add a row to the table as I type into G11. So I'll add part number S002, tab to give it a description of Excel sticker, tab again to give it the price of $3, press enter, and oops, this creates another line in the table. I don't want to add that extra blank line, but if I undo, this will bring me back to the previous cell. So now let's look at the drop down list that'll show up in the part number column in column A. I'll click on the next available cell, and will you look at that? We've got S002, select that, and we can order Excel stickers. Looking great. Now what would happen if we deleted a row from our products table? So I'm going to highlight the table row for the 32 by 32 LED sign. We'll assume everybody's buying the 64 by 32 with twice the lights, but only five bucks more. So we're going to stop carrying the 32 by 32 sign. And notice that our order already has one of those ordered, the seventh row of our customer order. So with this row highlighted in my table, I'm going to right click to bring up the context sensitive menu. Then I'll select delete select table rows that row goes away and Excel keeps the part number and the quantity in the customer order but it clears out the description and price since the item for part number LD001 no longer exists now if I want to go back in here and select a new part number LD002 for example we see that that's a valid part number the description and the price are updated and the customer order is recalculated cool and our point of sale system is looking pretty slick. I think I'll add a double border at the bottom of the headers from A4 through E4. And I'll add a single border at the bottom of the range A10 through E10. And for our final act, if we give this to the user, we might not want the products table and the discount table to show in the same worksheet as the customer order. Well, it's pretty easy to move data to a new worksheet. And in our case, we can move these tables to their own worksheet and still have them used in the customer order portion of our point of sale system. Let's do that. Why don't we first name the current worksheet point of sale by double clicking on the name sheet one in the tab in the lower left. Then we'll type in the new name point of sale and press return. And then we can add a new worksheet by clicking on the plus next to this tab. The new worksheet is added. It's named sheet one. Let's change the name to products. Then we'll return to the point of sale worksheet. Then we'll highlight our products data, including the first row, which technically isn't inside of the table, but we'll highlight from G1 through I10. Then we'll cut this. The shortcut for this is Command X on the Mac, Control X on Windows. Then we'll click back on the Products tab. 
We'll paste this into our worksheet. That's Command V on the Mac or Control V on Windows. Then we can zoom into 200% so we can see it better. But if we head back to the point of sale worksheet, I'll delete a few of the entries that I've already got in here. And now let's see if we can add new entries and gather data from the products table, even though it's on another worksheet. And if I use my keyboard shortcut, Command down arrow, Alt down arrow on Windows, I can see all of my values are showing up in my drop down list. Outstanding. If we select an item like RK001, Robot Kick goes in as a description, the price is $55, add a quantity of one, and our customer orders are working perfectly. Nice! Now let's take a look at how our formula has changed. I'll double click inside of cell C7 so the formula is highlighted, and we can see Excel put the name of the worksheet, products, followed by an exclamation point in front of any reference to cells that are located on the products worksheet. Now this is Excel syntax for handling formulas that span multiple worksheets in a workbook, and the nice part of this is we didn't have to edit the formula at all. Excel did all the work for us. Now if I press escape to get out of the formula editor, then double click on E12, we don't see the worksheet name here since this formula refers to cells that are on the same worksheet, but after you complete the next challenge, you'll see this formula has changed too. Just be sure to press escape to get out of the formula editor before starting the challenge. Now what is that challenge? Do the same with the discount list. So turn this into a table, change the table to the format with black headers and row outlines just like our products table had, then create a new worksheet to the right of the products worksheet, name this discount, cut out all of the discount information from the point of sale worksheet and paste it into the discount worksheet. And if you do it right, everything should still work perfectly on the point of sale worksheet. So why don't you pause, give this a shot. I know you can do it. Resume when you're done. And let's take a look at a solution for this challenge. So first I'm gonna turn the discount list into a table by highlighting the range from G13 through H18. Then I'll use the table creation shortcut, Command T on the Mac, Control T on Windows. My table has headers, so I'll just click OK. And that's not the style that I want, but I'll click on the left arrow and find the table style with the black headers and the row outlines and click that. And now I'll highlight all of the list data that I want to move, but before I cut this out, I'm going to create my new worksheet. So I'll click on the plus in the lower left hand corner. A new worksheet is created just to the right of the point of sale worksheet. I'll double click on that name and change it to discount. Then I'll click and drag this worksheet tab to move it after the products worksheet. Then I'll return to point of sale. The area that I want to cut out is already highlighted, so I'll just use the cut keyboard shortcut. That's Command X on Mac, Control X on Windows. And once you press the cut keyboard shortcut, you should see the marching ants around your selection area. Then I'll return to the discount worksheet. I'll paste it in with a Command V or Control V, depending on your platform. Zoom it into 200%. This looks great. And now if I head back to the point of sale worksheet and try things out, ah, one more thing to be careful of. We haven't protected our worksheet again, so if we gave this to a user, they'd be able to edit the stuff that isn't highlighted in yellow, but this is an easy fix. We'll head back to the review ribbon. We'll click on protect sheet. That toggles on worksheet protection. We won't add a password, but we'll click OK. Mac users see a little padlock next to the protected worksheet, and this is a nice heads up that we've only protected our point of sale worksheet. Now, if we were releasing this to users, we'd want to make sure that we protected the other two worksheets as well, assuming that we didn't want anyone else to change the product list or the discount table. Now, when we tab around, we only move within the yellow areas. Those are the areas that we unlocked. It's not because they're yellow. And I'm so proud of your work, I'm going to order 100 Excel stickers so that I can give one to each of you. Or at least I'm going to do that in our fake store. Now the discount is updated perfectly, even though the table is on the other worksheet. And with that, we're done. Outstanding work, Your Excellency. You built a point of sale system in Excel. Once again, we covered a ton of topics. We work with data validation, drop down lists, how to create input messages and error alerts, cell locking and unlocking, worksheet protection, and we worked with multiple worksheets. Point of sale, more like point of awesomeness, at least where your Excel skills are concerned. So keep tallying up that big learning and be excellent to each other.